All right, biologists, this is topic A3.1, diversity of organisms. Now let's start by looking at this diagram of the diversity of insects. Remember, this is not just all animals, not even all organisms, just insects, and it's incredibly diverse. So let's take a look here, focus on these groups here, the moths and butterflies. And when we zoom in that group, we see a huge variety. This is just a sample of this variety, right? It's not even everything. So we're going to focus on this tiny group up here. And then we can see that there are so many genus and so many species. And that's not all that exists. But even when we focus on one genus, we still see a lot of variety. Variation between organisms is a defining feature of life. There is immense variation, right? Even within one species, look at how many different people you encounter every day. There's a huge variation and that's very important for natural selection and for ecosystem resilience, right? Natural selection, because you cannot choose if everything is the same. And if you have many different species that could play a similar role in an ecosystem, if by some occurrence, one of the species disappears, the other one can step up and take the place, right? It can occupy the niche so that the ecosystem doesn't collapse. But all this variety poses a challenge for classification, right? So humans have been classifying things since the dawn of consciousness. But these classifications were problematic in one way or another. It was the Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus who created that classification system based on external and internal structure of the organisms. Basically, if it looks the same, they belong to the same species. That's the morphological definition of species. If it looks like a duck, has a beak like a duck, wings like a duck, feet like a duck, has the insides of a duck, well, then it must be a duck. So this classification was basically around at that time. And the biggest jump that Carl Linnaeus did was to create the binomial system for naming these organisms, right? So let's take a look at this specimen here of what in English you call a human, but in Portuguese, they call it humano. Same with Italian, they call it humano, but in Greek, they would call it anthropos. In Chinese, if I'm not mistaken, it's ren. So it's really hard to communicate that we're talking about the same species if we're all talk speaking in different languages. So Linnell said, okay, stop with all that. Each species has only one scientific name and no two species can share the same name. That means one species, one name. And to avoid favoring one language over the other, we are going to choose Latin, which arguably favors a whole family of languages over all others. But we're not going to discuss that in this video. So this individual here, who, by the way, is me, or at least was me a few years ago, we're going to call that Homo sapiens. And since I'm writing this by hand, I have to underline it. So if you're writing your test, paper two, underline it. The first letter of the genus is always uppercase. So the name has two parts since it's binomial. That means it has two names. The complete name of the species has two parts. This here is the genus. You can have more than one species in the same genus. It's like they are siblings, as if they are like close cousins. They are very closely related species. Now, some books are going to call these the species. And I absolutely hate that because it's a binomial system. The species name has two parts. This sapiens is not a species. The species is homo sapiens. And because of that, we call this specific epithet. It's kind of like a tag to specify, to precise what species in the genus here we are talking about. But this whole thing, this is the species. So the first letter of the genus is always uppercase and all the others are lowercase. The genus can be abbreviated if previously mentioned. You've heard of E. coli, but what you might not know is that this is not enough. Just saying E. coli is not enough because these two organisms here, they are very different. 
This one is Escherichia coli and it is a bacterium. This here, on the other hand, is Entamoeba coli and it is a protozoan, an eukaryote. So they are not the same thing at all. And since each species has only one name and no two species can share the same name, you can see that coli here is not, cannot be the name of the species. The name of the species is Escherichia coli or Entamoeba coli. And since they are typed rather than written by hand, they are italicized. Cole here only means of the intestines because both organisms can live in intestines. And if you just mention E. coli, well, are you talking about the bacterion or are you talking about the protozoan? Because they are very different. And if you are a medical professional, you would know that there are very different treatments for one or the other. So you have to write the full name first. And then if you mention it again in the text, then you can abbreviate to E. coli or E. coli. You don't have to write the whole genus as long as you've done it at least once in that text. But the morphological definition of species was not enough. At some point, we needed a new definition, and we came up with the biological concept of a species. The biological definition, according to Mayer, is a species are groups are of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other such groups. What, the, what does that mean? It means either populations who are actually having babies with each other or they could if we didn't have certain barriers. Maybe we have a fertility issue that doesn't have anything to do with the species. It's just individuals. Maybe they could interbreed, but one population is in Mexico and the other one is in Australia. They do not meet, therefore they do not interbreed. So populations that are actually having babies with each other, or they could have babies with each other, potentially, and they are reproductively isolated from other such groups. Such groups meaning species. That means they cannot have babies with other species. So species can have babies with itself, but not with other species. That's the idea of biological concept of species. Now, there are limitations for that definition as well. Extinct organisms, you cannot see non-avian dinosaurs reproducing, for example. So what constitutes a species of a non-avian extinct dinosaur will be their physical characteristics. Asexual reproduction. Let's go back to bacteria. Bacteria do not reproduce sexually. They reproduce by binary fission. And to make things worse, they can share plasmids horizontally with different species. So we need to use different definitions for what constitutes a species of bacteria. And hybrids like the liger or the mule. Liger is the offspring of a tiger and a lion, and the mule is the offspring of a horse and a donkey. Now, we can all agree that lions and tigers belong to different species. So how come they can have babies? Well, those babies, the hybrid, the liger, they are are not fertile. You cannot make more ligers by interbreeding ligers. You cannot make more mules by interbreeding mules. They are not fertile. So we can amend that definition and say, well, a species can have babies with itself and those babies are fertile. Because if the babies are not fertile, well, then you're talking about two different species. Now, the diversity of chromosome numbers. In a given species, the number of chromosomes is constant. For example, in Homo sapiens, like this guy, that's Mr. Guerra again a few years ago. So the number of chromosomes in humans is 46. In chimpanzees, on the other hand, it's 48. Unless we are talking about exceptions like Down syndrome or Klinefelter syndrome, but those are the exceptions and not the rule. The rule is 46, right? And the rule for chimpanzees, pantroglutitis, is 48. Now, there's a hypothesis that the chromosome 2 in humans rose from the fusion of chromosomes 12 and 13 with a shared primate ancestor. So can we test this hypothesis? Well, we can try, and for that, we can make use of a karyogram. Karyograms are these diagrams representing the chromosomes. They are obtained by actually photographing the chromosomes during cell division. You can use chemicals to stop cell division in a cell. You can burst the cell open, photograph the chromosomes, and then sort them from the biggest to the smallest, 
and you will see that homologous chromosomes, that means chromosomes of the same pairs, have the same pattern of bands. The bands match every time. So here we have a diploid organism. That means it has two sets of chromosomes, 22 autosomes plus one heterosome pair. This is a human, a chromosomically male human. This one is a chromosomically female human because it has two X's and no Y. And you see that the pattern of bands is the same. Look at here, the pair number one, we start with a dark, light, dark, light, dark, light. Here is the same thing, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light. The same pattern every time. Now we can compare this human here, that's Mr. Guerra with October Halloween tie, taking a selfie, and we have the 22 XY chromosomes, and we can check the pattern of bands, and we can compare that with pantroglodites, with a chimpanzee. Now, if the quality of the image was better, we could compare the pattern of chromosome 12 and 13 to that of human chromosome number two to determine if the hypothesis was plausible or not. Some hypotheses can be tested, some cannot. For example, species of dinosaurs. There's a scientist who proposed that some fossils that we attribute to being a certain species are actually infant forms, child forms of other dinosaurs that we attribute to another species. Can we test that? No, we can't. It's, it's a hypothesis that cannot be tested. So not everything, unfortunately, can be tested. Unity and diversity of genome. So the genome is the whole of genetic information of an organism that includes mitochondrial DNA, that includes chloroplast DNA. And the genome of a species is mostly the same for all individuals. That's what makes you human. That's what makes rice, rice. That's what makes shiitake, shiitake. It's the genome of that species. But variation exists and especially single nucleotide polymorphisms and simple tendon repeats. Single nucleotide polymorphisms are many forms of a gene that change by only one base. So if you go back to the nucleic acid video, you're going to see that DNA is a sequence of nucleotides. They have bases that will determine the genetic sequence. Now, if you have many forms of a given gene and they only change by one base here and there, you have single nucleotide polymorphism. And simple tendon repeats are just repeats of a sequence and the number of repetitions vary according to individuals. Those sequences are non-coding. That means those sequences do not belong to a gene that will turn into a protein that will code to a protein or an RNA. Those are non-coding sequences and they vary a lot. And we can use those for DNA fingerprinting to identify and match sequences, samples that you have with individuals. And finally, the diversity of eukaryote genomes. Here we have not just eukaryotes, just so you can have a wider idea of what genomes look like. We know that eukaryote genomes tend to be larger than prokaryotes. Here we have the huge jump from the order of 4,000 to 12,000 here in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a yeast. And we have this range here. And this whole range, sometimes not as expected. Here we have Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a plant, and Drosophila melanogaster, which is the fruit fly. And they have the same genome, the same size of genome. Of course, not the same genes, but their genome is the same size and not that different from the worm here. And then you think, well, but something much more complex than a fruit fly must have more genes, right? What is this one? Well, this is corn. Corn has much greater genome than the fruit fly and not that different from a mouse or a human. So you and corn in terms of genome size, not that different. And you think, well, if humans have this many genes, well, this must be absolutely amazing. Yeah, that's wheat. We make bread with it. So there's no correlation here necessarily between complexity of an organism, however you might define that, and genome size within eukaryotes. Well, that's it for today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave a comment, 
and I'll see you next time.